Hi there, so welcome to this first video for uh, my lectures, David Dyer's lectures on MSE 307 Engineering Alloys. Um, and uh, essentially the way these all go is I, I give eight lectures uh, and there are notes to go with these. Um, and in this, this first segment we'll just talk about really what the course is about and then we'll talk a little bit about material selection. Um, now. MSC 307 Engineering Alloys is a course that aims to build a synthetic understanding of engineering alloys, how they work, uh, how to design with them, how they are designed with by machine designers, and how to make them, and how all of those things interact, how the alloying and the manufacturing and uh, the component design all interact. You know, it, Some components may not be makeable by all methods, which will control what sort of alloys you can have, what sort of processing you can have. Um, and so there's a lot of facts, but and Einstein said, um, I don't carry such information in my mind since it's readily available in books. You know, we now have the internet. Uh, almost all information is available to us now, if we can find it. Um, and he said, but the value of a college education isn't s in the learning of many facts, but the training of the mind to think. So what are we doing here? What we're doing here is we're taking the the framework that we have from the stuff that we did in first and second year, dislocations, phase diagrams, those sorts of things, um, and we're putting on them the threads of how different alloy systems work to build up a tapestry of how alloying works, how uh, materials, how metals work. Um, and if you're finding that you're just focusing on the threads, and you can't see the tapestry while well, you're looking too close and you're worrying too much about the individual facts. And if the framework, if you don't have the framework in place, it'll be very difficult to uh, thread the tapestry. Um, so you need a good framework, a good underlying bed of theory to lay the facts on in order for it to make a sense as a coherent whole, in order for you to put it all together. And that's the challenge in this course. And if you do put it all together, then actually the facts fall into place relatively easily and aren't so hard to remember. <laughs> So it's really wrong to think of this course as a procession of facts to be memorized and learned for an exam. Um, but the right thing is to think about it as an exploration of how alloying works in practice. Um, so another way to think about it is that it's a way of putting a, um, a, a practical set of eyes over the theoretical orientation that you've done in the degree so far. Um, now, uh, there are really two overarching goals for uh, the metallurgist in making alloys is to understand how to design alloys and microstructures to order, that is, that, that do what we want them to do, uh, that get better all the time. And the other one is how to manufacture components with those alloys that don't unexpectedly break. That is, when we say it'll, it'll survive in service for so many hours, it'll survive. Um, and we won't be excessively conservative there, we won't say it'll last Ooh, you know, maybe a few weeks, but it lasts for years. And um, we won't say uh, that it'll last when actually it breaks and, in, uh, and potentially causes loss of life. Um, so we have lots of things that come together in that. Solubility in the phase diagram determines how much alloying element you can put in, which determines how much solution strengthening you can have. The phase diagram determines what it m strengthening precipitates we can have um, that then give us strength, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, let's think about a little bit how the course is arranged. Um, essentially, I give eight lectures, uh, Dr. Vronsov, Vasily Vronsov gives eight lectures, and Professor Tony Paxton gives eight lectures. Mine, I have four introductory lectures, and then essentially there are three groups of four lectures on titanium, nickel, and aluminium alloys. Um, and then Tony Paxton gives a, a, an eight lecture course on steel. Steel's, of course, really important because they're the most widely used by tonnage engineering material uh, after concrete. Um, and, uh, and titanium and, and nickel and aluminium, they're mostly aerospace materials, and that reflects the industry that there is in the UK. Um, so for these first four introductory lectures, in this lecture we'll talk about uh, introducing the course, we'll talk about properties and alloy selection, and then in the second segment we'll talk about airframes and jet engines and lifing. Um, that'll lead us on thinking about lifing and, and defects that, and how they give rise to cracks. Will lead us into um, processing, how we cast and forge uh, aerospace materials, specialty metals, um, and all these different acronyms of different melting processes and forging. 
And having thought about how we make them and how defects arise, that'll take us through to an example of a defect in service, uh, the Sioux City disaster, where we'll look at a case study of how air accident investigations work. Um, and then the last lecture, we'll put some theory of alloying in place before we move on to the main alloy systems, and that's the Hume Rothery rules and alloy design. So now let's <coughs> um, stop to think for a moment. I guess the other thing to say is, uh, of course, I'm giving this, this course by peer instruction for my eight lectures. That reflects the, the way the first and second year courses were done, and it has been very popular. So the idea here is you, you read the notes, um, watch the video beforehand, and then we discuss it in the lecture. If you haven't done the, the reading, uh, watched the video, thought about it, then there will be no point having the discussion because you won't have anything to say. Um, and the discussion, what we're aiming to do is sort out people's queries and questions and things they don't, misunderstandings, um, such that actually you're in a good place before the exam. And if you're, you're not familiar with that, if you're on the MSc, there's a, a, a segment on that in my 104 lectures. It's segment 1.2. It's called What is Peer Instruction? It's on YouTube. Search for it on the internet. Um, the lectures and the, and the videos uh, you can all access through diedavid.com. Um, they're all there. Um, and especially the notes will be useful to you. Um, the other thing to say uh, here is that, of course, um, uh, it's a, a traditional summary exam. Uh, take three questions from five, uh, plus a compulsory one if you're on the MSC. Um, and uh, what's the last thing to say? What's the last thing to say? Uh, oh, yes. Um, the other thing is you're at a stage where um, you're going to start uh, uh, as a graduate, you're then no longer in a situation where people are going to teach you if you're going to find out new things, but you're going to explore in whatever area you work new niches of, of stuff that weren't lectured in your degree. And you're going to find out about those by reading books and reading journal articles. You're no longer going to find out about things by being lectured, uh, by being taught by a, an expert. Um, and that's the difference between a graduate and the school leaver, is the graduate can teach themselves, can extend their knowledge in their field by reading. Um, and if you move on to do research, you'll start reading by reading research papers. And um, one of the skills that you need to develop, therefore, at the it is tail end of a degree, is the skill of being able to read papers. So, um, for, for both those reasons. So, one of the things I'll do in, in some of these lectures is I'll ask you both to read the notes and to read a paper before we get to the lecture, and that'll give us something to discuss. But I'll give those to you as we go through. So, need to move on to think about uh, material selection, and and our examples here will be uh, will be aerospace examples because it's the field I'm familiar with. Uh, it's a big industry for the UK, and it's a big industry that results in a lot of R and D for reasons we'll discuss a little bit later. Um, but uh, unlike uh, from materials R and D perspective, um, it has the profit margins and the performance incentives that will pay for R and D. So a lot of materials R and D in the UK is very aerospace focused, actually, uh, which is um, uh, anomalous and strange if you're in the automotive business, but the automotive business basically doesn't have the profit margin or hasn't done in the UK historically. It does in Germany, but it hasn't in the UK to support an R&D base, whereas our, our aerospace industry has quirks of, of different countries' research bases. If, you, if we're doing this course in Canada, we do quite a different course because they're a country that does a lot of mining. Um, and then it would be a, a different focus. And we're at that sort of stage in the degree where the quirks of the courses are, are a reflection of the national character and the character of the institution and the character of the, the lecturers, such as we have character, of course. Um, so here's a plane. Here's a, a Boeing 787, a uh, recently launched plane. This one's a good one because it's got a, a Rolls-Royce engine, and we like Rolls-Royce. Um, and we see that uh, in flight, of course, it's supported on the wings here, which bend um, on the ground. Uh, it's supported on the landing gear, and the wings are like this, drooping down. And as you go along, you just put it on the wings, and the wingtips come up. And on a big plane, they'll come up by a couple of meters, actually. Um, and so this is a structure that you design in one configuration, and when it stretches, as, uh, then it gets into its flying configuration. So we don't actually build the structure we want to fly. We build the structure that, when loaded, will fly. Um, and this is a stiffness, or for some things, a stiffness-limited structure, um, this wing here. And <coughs> one thing to say about this plane is compare it to a plane from the 1950s, compare it to a Boeing 707, say. It still looks like a tube with wings with engines hung on the wings. So in 60 years, airplane design hasn't fundamentally changed very much. 
Um, and uh, the uh, one of the things to say is this is really a, a, a most equivalently a replacement for the 767, which came out in uh, first flight was in 1982 or 1983. This came out in 2011 or so. So in about 30 years, this has achieved something like a 20, 25% re reduction in fuel burn, according to Boeing, per revenue passenger kilometre. Um, and uh, so that's about a 1% a year improvement in fuel efficiency, which on the one hand, this is quite dramatic. On the other hand, because these are 80, 90% thermodynamic efficient, so they're pretty stunning. On the other hand, it's not that amazing compared to you know, the internet, <laughs> cars, mobile phones. Everything has got a lot better. These are relatively mature products. Um, and Boeing will say about half the improvement in fuel efficiency comes from the airframe and about half from the engines. And half the improvement in fuel efficiency for the airframe is down to reductions in weight to using better materials, largely carbon fibre and titanium replacing aluminium. Um, in the engine, Rolls-Royce and, uh, and GE, the two world's largest uh, large jet engine manufacturers, um, they would say that, again, about half their improvement is from the materials. So overall, about half the improvement here is from the materials. Relatively little is from things in the aerodynamics, like you know, the straight wing tips and so on here. Um, mostly, this is improvements uh, in, uh, rather than in design, in the materials that we're using. And that's one of the reasons why it's so slow. The other big change that's happened in the last 30 years in aviation, in, at least in military aviation, is the advent of unmanned aerial vehicles. And um, 10, 15 years ago, when this sort of was starting, people were very excited that this might change things, that we wouldn't care so much about the uh, quality of the materials, for instance. We might let a few things fail and have these be cheaper. But it turns out the cost driver isn't given by really by the materials. You know, the, the jet engine here, by the way, this engine costs about as much weight for weight as silver. Um, now it's really extremely expensive. So is that because if we, if we could use cheap materials because we didn't mind because there wasn't a pilot in there, then uh, would we be uh, able to make these things cheaper such that the military could afford to buy them, you know, which is a serious problem for modern militaries? It turns out the answer is uh, not really. And there's two reasons. One is... Uh, if these are going to fly in civilian airspace, you can't afford to have them crash because of people on the ground. <laughs> and the other one is actually a lot of the cost is driven by the avionics and the weapon systems uh, and the uh, radar systems and satellite systems and so on, rather than by the airframe uh, and engine. So for instance, for a, a destroyer that might cost a billion dollars, uh, only about 80 million pounds of that cost is constructing the hull. Uh, similarly, actually the material cost in a plane, whilst it's a big number, it's nothing compared to the radar systems. Um, so they haven't, from a materials point of view, changed the world. So turning to the jet engine, here's a, a model of a, a cutaway schematic for the Trent XWB jet engine. And uh, it's probably worth just having a quick reprise of, of how this works, what it, what it does. So at the front end here, we have a fan, have a, a series of rotating blades. And what they do is that they're fed by a shaft and they push uh, a lot of the air that comes in uh, and accelerate it. And actually uh, something like 80% of the thrust and 90% of the air goes around the outside, comes out around this bypass duct and bypasses the rest of the core of the engine. So it's a shrouded propeller. It's just pushing the plane along. The remaining air enters what we first call the compressor. And there's a series of rotating blades and static blades that act then to compress the air um, and uh, something by a uh, pressure ratio of something like 40 or 50. Um, and so uh, the air goes from something like 0.2 atmospheres if you're up at, at cruise at 30,000 feet uh, up to uh, something like 50 times that, so something like 10 atmospheres um, of pressure. Um, and as you heat up the air, of course, it gets hotter, the gas laws, um, and that, that's potentially problematic. You know, if you're making this out of aluminium, aluminium has no mechanical properties really in the long term above you know, 150 degrees C. And so as the air gets up to temperatures like 5, 6, 700, 800 degrees C here, then it's not going to work anymore. Um, 
And uh, so we need to use materials that have some ability to withstand load at temperature and, that, and have a reasonable weight. And that takes us towards titanium first uh, and then towards uh, nickel superalloys when we, once we get beyond about 450, no, 550 degrees C. <coughs> then once we've gone through the compressor, we mix it in, in this chamber here, that guy, that guy, um, which is called an annular combustor. We, we blow some fuel in um, to that combustor, uh, mix it with the air, it ignite it and burn it. And of course then it, the gas expands and it expands out through this turbine, uh, giving you a jet out the back. And the turbine extracts the energy to turn the compressor and turn the fan. And that, that's how a jet engine works. It's called sometimes it's called suck, suck it in, squeeze it down in the compressor, let it go bang in the combustor and let it blow out of the turbine. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Um, which is a, a, a mnemonic for remembering it that uh, the guys at Rolls use. And different parts of the engine are in different regimes where different properties will be, limit, will be the limiting factor. So for the wings, we had uh, them being stiffness limited. Landing gear actually is strength limited. And they're strength limited not as you're landing or taking off, because actually then a lot of the load is still on the wings. But when you're most slow and there's no, there's no aerodynamic lift, and the pilot sh shanks it over to go onto a taxiway and puts a big shear on, that's when you need the strength in the landing gear. Um, and for that, you just want the strongest material you can for the weight, because you've got to perch your plane on it. And the rest of the time, the landing gear is just parasitic. And it's something like 10% of the airframe weight is the landing gear. Right? So it's a, it's a lot of weight that you've got to cart around the world. It costs you a lot of jet fuel. So you want it to be as, as strong a material as possible. The turbine blades, so the, the blades back here, just in the, the first stage after the, uh, after the combustor, they are limited by the temperature and the load, that is the continuous extension at load, which is a phenomenon called creep, and that's what lifts them, because as they creep, they'll start to foul the, the shrouds of the engine. Um, on the other hand, if I go back to this fan blade here at the front, these have, um, you know, all like all structures, they'll have some resonant modes, and as you come up to speed, you'll go through some of those modes. You'll be at cruise, you won't be in them, you know, you'll design the engine so that doesn't happen, but um, uh, as you go accelerate up through, you'll put a few thousand HCF cycles in. Um, and if you do that for a few thousand flights, suddenly you're in the millions of cycles. And so the high cycle fatigue can be limiting for these fan blades. Or for the compressor blades or fan blades or compressor discs, you can be limited by low cycle fatigue, by the number of flight cycles, the number of load associated with every climb or whatever it is. Um, another example of an LCF limited structure is actually a nuclear pressure vessel. Those are, are designed to undergo, uh, to sit at operating temperatures. But when you cool them down, of course, you have thermal expansion stresses and so on. And quite often that will give you a low cycle fatigue, plastic strain cycle. Um, and it's, but it's okay because nuclear power stations is designed to be on power for several years at a time. Um, so you might, in a 40-year life, only go through a few hundred cycles once you have grid trips and so on. But if you have a lot of trips due to the grid failing or whatever it is, then you might start to run into the LCF life of the pressure vessel before you were expecting or hoping. Um, so that can be an issue for nuclear power stations. And it's worth looking at you know, what with the materials we, um, we can use. It, just think of simply about uh, yield stress and stiffness. Here's the uh, stiffness and yield stress for a, a number of different aerospace materials, carbon fiber polymers, uh, the landing gear alloy, type 3, the fan blade alloy, type 6, 4, uh, an aluminium wing skin alloy, and uh, a landing gear steel. Um, and yes, in an Ashby map, you could be using E over the root of density or den square root of E over density or whatever it is, but I'm just going to normalize them by density. Um, uh, and ask which one is the most efficient for the minimum weight structure that we can, can get. And then you see that most metals, the modulus is fairly fixed and very difficult to change, and the density is fairly fixed and difficult to change, and they mostly have the same um, specific stiffness, same stiffness per unit density. And the exception, of course, is carbon fiber. The other exception is magnesium. Um, and so if you want a stiffness limit structure, carbon fiber will be dramatically better. <coughs> now, for strength, we have a bit more choices. You know, tame alloys vary in strength from 900 to 1400 MPa, and so their specific strength varies from about 200 to 300. Whereas, uh, tame alloys, this is about as good as tame alloys can get. 
steals, you know, this is a dramatically amazing steal. Uh, your, your typical re rebar or the stuff you sell on your chair, it's about 300 MPA. A good steal is a gigapascal. This is a stunning steal. Um, but even then, it's not that much better than our normal titanium alloy. And usually, it'll be, you know, significantly worse. It'll be an eighth of that number, seventh of that, that number, um, which is dramatically worse than titanium. But if a really good steel can get into the ballpark, but still titanium would be better. But what's dramatically better than any of these is the carbon fiber again. And that's why carbon fiber composites have become popular. Um, but there have been some oopses along the way. So this plane, the F-22, when it was first uh, conceived in the mid-90s, it was supposed to be a plastic plane, so-called a, 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 a carbon fiber plane. But as the engine development cycle went on, more and more of that composite was replaced by titanium. Um, and the problem, and the reason for replacing it with titanium was that titanium has the same stiffness here, 110, 120 GPA, and so you can get it to modulus match, so you can replace titanium uh, carbon fibre components with titanium components without having to redesign everything from a modulus point of view, from a load shedding point of view. The only problem was that titanium would be heavier. Um, and that's annoying, right? That means that this plane always struggled to meet its weight budgets. And um, when Boeing were making, developing the, the final stages of the program for the 787, they had a lot of problems with uh, the connections where the wing spars of the composite connected onto the main airframe. And that uh, is, is really a, a problem because carbon fiber composites only have these amazing properties in tension along the fiber direction. They're not very good transverse to the fibers. Okay, you can lay them up and do complicated 3D weaving things, but they're then going to be bad out of plane where you pull the plies apart. And so when you have a triaxial stress situation, composites tend to be not so good. Um, when you do things like put impacts in, in uh, put birds into them, they have a lot that sets up a lot of triaxial stresses, a lot of tensile stresses. They just pull the thing apart. At which point, you know, after a bird strike test, you need a dustpan and brush to pick up the pieces. Um, so the uh, the thing about uh, carbon fiber composites is uh, what you tend to do is put them with titanium for the connectors where you have the triaxial stress situation where titanium will be good. So as you increase the amount of CFRP in the airframe, you put in more tie. So this was an extreme example where we reverted a lot of the polymer composite into titanium. But even then, as you put in more composite, you tend to put in more tie. So the 787, the A350, incrementally, uh, passenger planes have more and more titanium in them. Um, and uh, composites have been a huge success, of course, but it has been accompanied by a lot of titanium. And the thing that's amazing about, we shouldn't really leave alloy selection without talking about this, uh, amazing about metals is their toughness. You know, uh, most ceramics have a toughness of about one megapascal root meter, um, you know, in the range of 0.2 to 5. Um, even a, a normal steel has a toughness of about 90 megapascals root meters. Um, and uh, that's a dramatic difference. That's 100 times tougher because metals have plasticity. They can absorb energy by plastic deformation, which means that they can uh, blunt cracks um, and they can, uh, fatigue cracks will grow slowly. They can be in a crash. And so they have ductility, toughness. Um, and that's why they're attractive. The great thing about a metal structure is you can bang into it with a you know, baggage cart and you just have to get a hammer and bang it back into shape. That's what your car mechanic does when you have a prang your car. With a composite structure, you can't do that. You have to replace it. And also, sometimes the damage, the cracks can be silent. They can be invisible. Um, and so you have a, a problem. And the other nice thing is we can quite often, quite late in the manufacturing sequence, tweak and optimize our, our tray between strength and toughness. So this is data for a bunch of beta titanium alloys. This is data for a bunch of aluminum and copper alloys. And moreover, if we go for super clean aluminium, if we get rid of some of the iron and silicon that gives us the uh, silicide defects that uh, can initiate uh, cracks, then we can get a bump in, in toughness as well if we're willing to spend the money to make it super clean. So there are things we can do to make them tougher if we need them or to make them stronger if we need them quite late depending on how the, uh, the machine design is doing. 
So what's my point in this section? My point is that alloy selection is a lot more complicated than Ashby diagrams. We're looking for a balance of properties across corrosion resistance, density, strength, toughness, uh, creep resistance, environmental performance, that uh, and manufacturability, weldability, rather than just one or two parameters in an Ashby map. Um, and it's heavily connected to system design and to manufacturing, a very coupled set of problems. And so to have a mature appreciation of how to design with alloys, we need to, to treat Ashby diagrams as a nice tool, but they're the start of an understanding of how to select alloys, not an end. Um, and so uh, when we're thinking about, lots of us when we're lecturing will make different claims about different alloys over the course of this, uh, this lecture course. We need to weigh those uh, enthusiasms that we make, uh, those claims that we make somewhat, and challenge us on them and ask us about them, because it is complicated. There's a lot to come out there, and there's a lot of richness there if we let it speak to us. Uh, and that's it for this segment. I'll see you for the next one, which is on jet engines and lifing.